Probably most of you, if not all of you, know the title of that song that Gail just played for us. There's a bomb in Gilead. Bomb, B-A-L-M. And today it's used of anointment to cover wounds. But in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a bomb was also used uh, for anointment for injuries. Gilead was then and is still today a mountain range that uh, runs along the Jordan River that's very dangerous to climb. And so God said to Israel, in this dangerous time in which you are living, Gilead, rough times, I am your balm, I am your soothing presence, I am your healer. And so God says, my grace, my love, my forgiveness is a balm to those of you who are spiritually injured as sinners. So on this day that we call Palm Sunday, there is a responsive reading in our hymnal that tells us when our Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, marched into Jerusalem to become our living Savior. So will you read with me, please, responsively from our hymnals, number 153, 153. And even though we're reading the scriptures out of the hymnal, please keep in mind that this is God's word. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphagia and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath needed him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke the disciples. God add his blessing upon this, the reading of his holy word. Will you stand and sing with me this most appropriate song as we continue to remember the coming of Jesus Christ? 191. Shall we stand and sing together, please? <laughs>
May we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here safely so that we can come from our separate homes and unite together in your presence, in your house of worship and prayer. We thank you so much that we have the opportunity to praise your name in worship, in music, and in word, and with the very meditations of our hearts. We welcome your presence. Above all, we praise you and thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, King of Kings. In his precious name, we pray together, and all of God's people join and said together, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I don't know how long I'm going to last in the, with this voice. I've been battling this with doctors, and they take this, I'll fix you right up. It hasn't worked yet, but at any rate. So would you turn in this flu season, look at somebody, put a smile on your face, and wave at them, please. <laughs> Very good, thank you. I want to thank Bob Stolp and Harold Bodine and John DePercio and Carolyn Meldrum for shoveling all the sidewalks and the steps. It's quite a task to do. And then Bob Lickfield plowed our parking lot and the borough allows them to use their equipment and he's the driver. And so we're glad that we have folks that make it possible for us to get into our facility without the uh, mishap. And I do want to congratulate um, Bob and Joanne Lickfield on their first grandson, first grandchild. James C. Lickfield was born this past Monday, eight pounds, four ounces, 20 inches long, and Father and dad, um, dad and mom say they, the baby just learned that he has lungs. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cute. That's great. That's congratulations to all of you, Bob. <laughs> now, Wednesday, this Wednesday, we are not going to have prayer meeting, Bible study. You're welcome to come, but you're going to be very lonely. Uh, <laughs> But we are on Thursday going to have Holy Thursday communion at 7.30. And this is where we review all the scriptures that pertain to what happened to our Savior on the night before he went to the cross to become our Savior. So Holy Thursday night at 7.30. Under the sermon outline, there's more information, including bringing in your flowers next Saturday. Please be sure each plan is marked in honor and memory of someone, and please bring them between 9 and 11 o'clock, being the deadline. Now, we are supposed to have flowers today for Lori St. Mar's birthday. Wow. But they're not here. I don't know. They were ordered. So, happy birthday without flowers. And uh, they are from your Aunt Alice Longmire and family. So we thank you very much. And we do apologize for whatever happened. I don't know. But I'll know by tomorrow, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Kathy's under new ownership, and uh, I don't know. But at any rate, very good. Let's worship the Lord by giving unto him our gifts, our tithes that are offering at this time.
appropriate song. Shall we stand and sing our doxology together? up our voices in thanksgiving and father as well as our open hearts with praise unto you for these blessings that you've presented unto us so that we can be part of the gospel of jesus christ in this ministry we ask your blessing upon these gifts and those who present them in the loving name of jesus christ and all believers join and said together amen, amen. <laughs> Thank you, Handbell Choir, for bringing us that special blessing on this special day. Appreciate it very, very much. I failed to mention Gail Cosby also had a birthday 
yesterday, I think. Wasn't it yesterday? <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble now. All right, let's go to prayer together and let me just bring to your attention some of the folks on our prayer list. Even though we don't mention everyone all the time, please understand that everybody on our prayer list is valuable to God. He loves them and so do we. Ed Jones continues to have some health issues. Margie Cutler still in the rehab center in Hamilton. Charles Roos is still uh, battling his side effects of his cancer treatment. Courtney Green still needs our prayer support as she awaits for a heart transplant. And Cheryl Green is undergoing some more tests regarding her difficulties. And then we want to uh, continue to pray for Elaine Stevenson upon the homegoing of her sister Adele Mattern. That service was held this past Friday. And one of her daughters, Joanne Heater, and Rick, are you here too? No, he's not here. He's in Maryland. Who cares? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Joanne's here. Thanks for being here, Joanne. Appreciate it. She was uh, one of our original organists. Uh, so it's great to have family together, even for a sad reason. Let's go to our missionary for the week is Ranch Hope. Uh, this is a special week for all of us, uh, Holy Week as we call it. But uh, Ranch Hope is a residential program for teenager young men who, who are having difficulty in life with uh, home struggles and so forth. And so they're housed there, they live there, they eat there, they, they're educated there but it's all in a Christian atmosphere. It's very evangelistic. So we're glad to support that ministry financially. But all this week, would you be in prayer during this holiday time for those young men who aren't going to be able to be home and the staff members as well? Now let's go to prayer and you pray privately and silently for a few moments. And then I'll ask you to join me in prayer. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, in that name that's above all other names, that of Jesus Christ, we come at your throne of grace with thanksgiving, thankful for Jesus Christ, thankful for how much you love us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that while we are limited in so many ways, you are not limited in any way. You are boundless in your love, your grace, your mercy, and you desire to forgive all who repent of their sins. And we're so thankful for our living Savior, Jesus Christ, the only Savior of the world, the only Messiah of Israel. And on this day, Heavenly Father, as you well know, we pause to remember when Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem to become the only Savior of the world. How the people celebrated, Heavenly Father, we remember as he entered Jerusalem. And yet, not a whole week later, those same celebrators shouted, Crucify him. And so we're mindful of our own sinfulness, our own sinful nature, Heavenly Father, where we praise you on Sunday, and then so often, too often, we grievously sin against you. Yet, Father, we know that you desire to cleanse us and to restore us, and for that we are thankful as we confess and repent of our sins. We're mindful of those who we know by name, those that we love, who are still unsaved because they continue to reject Jesus Christ as Savior. We pray earnestly for their salvation experience coming to Jesus Christ by faith. For those of us who are saved, born again with God the Holy Spirit, we thank you for our salvation, the forgiveness of all sin, but we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are suffering at this very moment 
because they proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior. Instill within them trust and perseverance as they live for you in those areas which reject Jesus Christ. We pray for the brokenhearted, those who are discouraged and lonely, troubled in any way. Heavenly Father, you are the great comforter, the one who meets their every need. Thank you for Dave Bailey, Ranch Hope, for raising up that ministry that for over 50 years have helped troubled young people in a way that brings, brings honor to your name and a blessing to them. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us the truth that Jesus Christ is alive and coming again as the King of Kings. In his wonderful saving name, we pray together and all of God's people join and said together, amen. Shall we stand and sing another appropriate song for this day? Number 154, will you stand and sing with me, please? Shall we stand and sing together? already would you say amen before you sit down thank you please be seated now before we go home would you open your copy of God's infallible word <coughs> to Matthew chapter 21 going to draw our attention to many verses in Matthew chapter 21 we've already read about for our call to worship when Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem through the Gospel of Luke. But here we see in Matthew's Gospel the same account of when he entered Jerusalem. And I'll not take the time to read it now, but I'll draw your attention to several verses in Matthew chapter 21 and a few other verses as well. As when we consider together that time when God came to town. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us a reason to call this day Palm Sunday, the day when we especially acknowledge the coming of victory into the world and into our lives through your only begotten Son and our living Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, may we who proclaim him as our Savior become excited over this remembrance of that great day when he entered Jerusalem 
We thank you, Heavenly Father, that that same Savior is coming again. That same Savior desires to ride into hearts and save souls. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our minds and our hearts will be protected by distraction so that we might receive from your word your blessing. We welcome your blessing upon the presentation and the reception of your word. In the loving name of Jesus Christ and the power of God, the Holy Spirit, we humbly ask this prayer together again. All believers join and said together, Amen. Let me tell you about a six-year-old girl whose father was the pastor of the church and her mom and after church one Sunday, as they were sitting around the table having lunch, the six-year-old daughter said, Daddy, may I ask you a question? And her dad, the pastor, said, Sure, honey. What do you want to know? She says, Well, ever since I can remember, every time you would come to the pulpit to preach a sermon, you would pause fold your hands, and bow your head. And I just wondered why you do that. He said, well, I'm just offering a quiet prayer that God will give me a great sermon to preach. And she said, Daddy, may I ask you another question? He said, sure, honey, what is it? How come God never answers your prayer? <laughs> I don't know what your opinions are going to be as we looked in Matthew chapter 21, but I pray that you'll be blessed as I am blessed when I think about when God came to town that great day. He was fully man, fully God. I can't explain that, but that's the teaching of God's word. That's the faith of my heart that he was God, he is God. He is the one who was all powerful, omnipotent, all knowing, omniscient, and omnipotent, uh, omnipresent everywhere. He was the one who created the universe. God was the one who put the sky, stars in the sky, painted the sky blue, and the grass green. It is God who created all of human life, including babies. And that's why we're so against abortion, because the Bible says that God knew the baby when the baby was in the womb. So to take a baby's life is against God's will. But this God is the one who wrote in to Jerusalem on that donkey. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God revealing himself in three persons. God came to earth that day draped in flesh, sitting on a donkey, riding into Jerusalem. And when he did, let's look at first of all, Two reactions as to when he entered into Jerusalem that day. The one reaction was they accepted him. And when they accepted him, they wanted to be saved. The other reaction was one of rejection. And therefore, being lost. God wants all people to be re to repent and come to him and accept Jesus Christ as Savior so that we can be saved. That's the reaction he wants from all of us. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus Christ said, no one comes to the Father but through me. Not through Buddha, not through Muhammad, not through Hindu religion, not through good works, not through being a Baptist, only through Jesus Christ. 
And he wants us to accept that and put our faith in Jesus Christ, and therefore we will be saved. But if we don't, then we choose the consequences of rejection. John chapter 3, we all know verse 16, do we not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, shall never perish, shall never die, but shall live forevermore. But verses 17 and 18 says, but if you reject him as such, in verse 16, then God says, I will be your judge, and you will be condemned. And so the first reaction is one of acceptance, one of rejection. Now when they entered Jerusalem, Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem, God, they shouted, Hosanna, hallelujah. The Jewish people at that time thought that he was coming in as, as a king, that he was going to deliver them from the Roman Empire, and that they would become the ruling nation of the world. And so here he comes, and they're accepting him as such. And then there were the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who rejected him along with others. And that's why they shouted, crucify him. So the two reactions were one of acceptance, one of rejection. I don't know. What reaction do you have when you think about Jesus Christ? Is it one that says, I've accepted him as my savior and I'm so glad that I'm saved today or do you continue to reject him? Well, there's two responses, too. One of celebration. And one of callousness. This little joke I'm going to tell you, I always find my jokes funny, but not everybody does. But uh, I have to set this up so you get the understanding of this. I went to Bible college for four years in Rhode Island, which is a cute little state. You can go north, south, east, and west in less than two hours in that little slip of a state. But I spent four years there on the Narragansett Bay. After I graduated from Bible college, I went to uh, cemetery, I mean seminary, in uh, Filthy Delphia or Philadelphia, and a uh, little over four years there. And then after I graduated from there, I went to Hahnemann University a School of Psychiatry as a student, not as a patient, although there's some question about that. But here's the story. In Bible college, we always went to chapel, same as seminary, every uh, class day. And so the story is told of this one young Bible student came in to sit down in, in the chapel for chapel service, and he looked at the program for the day, and he said, oh, no. And there was a lady sitting right next to him, and she looked over to him and said, are, are you sick? Are you all right? He said, yeah, I'm all right. Well, why did you say, oh, no? He said, well, I just saw who was going to preach today. He is one of my professors. He is the dullest, most boring professor in the world. And as a preacher, he's even worse. She said to him, young man, do you know who I am? And he said, no, I don't. And she said, I'm the wife of the professor. <laughs> he then asked her, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> We're on YouTube in 89 countries. I often wonder <laughs> if those in some of those countries get American humor. <laughs> but at any rate, all right, let's look at celebration. Matthew chapter 21, verse eight and nine, the multitude, the crowds. I mean, this was more crowded than uh, the, the parade that was for the Super Bowl champs. And here he comes, not on a white stallion, as you would think a king should come 
He's on a donkey, humble, because he came to serve, not to be served. That's our Savior. So that was a bit strange that he came in on a donkey, but he is the king. And they were celebrating him, his arrival with the spreading out of palm leaves, which was the symbol of victory. In the olden days, in the Olympics, they didn't give out medals, they gave out crowns for the different levels of victory. But they were in the shape of palm leaves, the, son, the symbol of victory. And they took off their outer coats and laid them on the ground, the symbol of their humility, honoring him. So they welcomed him with, Hosanna, save us now. They celebrated his coming. And then there were the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and those that didn't believe at all. And their, their response was one of being callous, hard-hearted. We are surrounded by folks today. Some are in our families, some are in our neighborhoods, some we work right next to them, or we go to school next to them, and they mock Jesus Christ. And that's why they mock us, because we are with Jesus Christ. So they're callous. They don't want to hear about it. Tell somebody who cares. Go bother someone else. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 reads, But because of their stubbornness and unrepentant heart, they are under God's wrath. No one spends eternity in hell by God's choosing. God wants all to come to heaven, but those who reject him will spend eternity in hell. Now, I find it interesting that people want to believe in heaven, but they don't want to believe in hell. They can believe either one, but the word of God is those who accept him so spend eternity in heaven. And those who reject him will spend eternity in hell. So there was a reaction, response of celebration. There was a response of callousness. How excited are you about Jesus Christ? Don't look at the person next to you. Don't tap someone on the shoulder. The question is to you. The question is to me. I'm forever asking myself, am I still excited about Jesus Christ? And the answer is, thank God I am. I get teary-eyed. I, I get all welled up with emotion because of how much God has done and is doing for me. And I've never, ever lost that thrill. Are you celebrating Jesus Christ in your heart? Or have you become callous, hard-hearted, same old, same old? Two reactions is, as he rode into Jerusalem, as he came to town that day, one of acceptance, one of rejection. Two responses, one of celebration, one that was callous. A little girl asked her mother, one day, Mommy, what does God look like? She said, well, I don't know. No one knows he's a spirit. He doesn't have a body like you and I do. And she said, well, how can I know that he's really God? Mommy said, close your eyes for a moment. Keep them closed. Can you see Daddy that's in the kitchen? She said, no. Well, how do you know Daddy's here? Well, because I hear his voice. I, I, I can smell his wonderful fragrance. I can sense that he's here. And she said, exactly, that's the way it is with God. We can't see God, but we can know God. We can sense his word, his presence, his touch to bless us. So what is your response? Is it one of celebration 
is a one that's callous. What are two results? Well, if you look at verse 14 of Matthew chapter 21, you read that he went about healing. The greatest healing that anyone can experience is having your soul healed by Jesus Christ, covered by the blood of Christ. I'm cured forevermore. I might die physically of some disease or some accident, but I know I'm cured no matter what. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, the one who rode into Jerusalem that day rode into your heart. You accepted him as Savior, and that moment you became cured of the dreaded disease called sin and death in the grave. That was one result. He came to cure lost souls. But the other result was one of condemnation. In verse 13 of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus Christ said, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. That was religious people. Who God said, God the Son said, you're condemned if you reject me. What a day that must have been when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem humbly into that town, and he desires to ride into the hearts of people today. Anyone watching by the internet, watching by television, anyone in this place of worship, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ your Savior, let me just say this again. You'll never be able to stand before God and say, God, I didn't know I needed to be saved. Because God will just say, really? On March the 29th, a bald-headed preacher who wore a robe told you you needed to accept Jesus Christ your Savior. What is your response? He desires to ride into your heart. And all he asks us to do is by faith invite him to be our, your Savior and trust him <coughs> to be such. And you'll be born, born again with God the Holy Spirit and saved forevermore. And so no matter what happens in the world or whatever happens to you here on earth, you will always be with the Lord forevermore. Amen? Amen. So I invite you to invite him to be your Savior today. Let him ride into your heart to be your Savior by faith. If you say to me, oh, I'm saved, I'm born again, I want to share a story with you that Bill Hughes gave to me a few weeks ago. It's about a man who was terminally ill and he knew his days were numbered. And he had a, a, a wonderful plan of how he wanted his funeral to be conducted. So he asked the pastor, to come visit him, which the pastor did. And by the way, this is a little side street. Let me just say this. I'm of the old school, as they say, pastor. What pastors should be doing is shepherding their flock, which includes going to nursing home and hospitals and visitation and so forth. Uh, this is one of the few pastors that do that. I don't say that in any bragging way. I just want you to understand what's in pulpits out there. Pastors are coming with morning contracts, nine to five. That would be sweet. They want overtime. That's the truth. They do. Really. Back to the story. That was free. You don't have to pay anything on that. So the pastor went to this man and they talked about salvation and eternal life. And the pastor knew by his testimony that he was saved. He was going to go to heaven. But uh, the man picked out all the hymns that he wanted sung at the funeral service, the scriptures that he would like to have had read at 
his funeral service, and the pastor noted all of it all. And he said, I assure you, this is the way it will be. As the pastor was getting to leave after they had prayer, the man said, Pastor, may I ask one more request? He said, sure. He said, when I'm in the casket for the viewing, would you put a fork in my folded hands? And the pastor was kind of surprised. What kind of a request is that? But it, why do you want that? He said, because I've attended, as you know, church dinners for years. And every time we would have a church dinner, after we had the main course, one of the servers would come and say, keep your fork. The best is yet to come, meaning dessert. He said, I want people to see a fork in my folded hands. And I want them to ask you, why does he have a fork in his hands? And I want you then to tell him, tell them, whoever asks, the best has come. The best has come. When I tell you in that benediction, for 49, almost 45 years, of the 49 years I've been here, I've been saying that every single Sunday that I've been in this pulpit. The best is yet to come. I'm not kidding. That's not a cute little phrase that somehow is all over the place in the world. They've stolen my phrase. I joke when I say that. But the best, if you have Jesus Christ your Savior, be uplifted. Sagging spirits, painful bodies, the world is in turmoil, the world has gone insane. But the best is yet to come for those who proclaim Jesus Christ, for those who have let him ride into their hearts as a savior, as the king of kings. If you believe that, would you say amen? amen. And if you don't, if you weren't able to say amen, I'll be more than glad to sit down with you after the service and show you show you how you can allow Jesus Christ to ride into your town called your heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a reason to remember the reason he came into Jerusalem, which was to go to the cross and become our living Savior. We can't thank you enough, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ being the author and the finisher of our salvation. We gladly proclaim him as such, but we pray for the one around us who may not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior, that he or she will come to Jesus Christ even now by faith, allowing Jesus Christ to ride into his or her heart as Savior. Continue to bless us, Heavenly Father, as we continue to remember the day he rode into Jerusalem as God. Bless us now, Heavenly Father, with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, we pray together. And all believers join and said together, Amen. Now we're going to have our own Palm Sunday march of our of ourselves, we have fresh palm leaves and that uh, Cindy Storms actually peeled for us. And as our musicians play and as we sing our final hymn, Charles Coughlin always used to direct people, but he's with the Lord now. And uh, so I'm just assuming the back row can figure it out. Come down the side aisle, please. Pick up a palm leaf, go up the center aisle, return to your seat. We'll continue to sing till everyone has come and received a palm leaf. If you choose not to do that, that's okay. Just get in the way of everybody else and that's, they'll, they'll make room for you. But you come and receive a palm leaf and take it home as a symbol of Jesus Christ's coming. Let's stand and sing together and we'll keep singing till all have come. And please on the first stanza with the two back rows begin to make their way down and you follow. 192, let's stand and sing together.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that triumphant song to sing in truth from our hearts because it's based upon the truth of your word. We thank you for our celebration in our hearts as well as with our voices. Thank you for our musicians who brought us your blessing today. Thank you for giving us voices to sing to your honor and glory. Thank you for giving us faith to trust you as Savior, Lord, and King of Kings. Father, as we leave this place of celebration today, we are about to enter into situations, face responsibilities, encounter people, and we need to do that in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. We cannot do that in any way without your blessing upon us and within us as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And may we leave here again rejoicing over the truth that because Jesus Christ is alive, the best is yet to come. Amen and 